it's time to head out to get my fix. In my 20s, I was diagnosed with severe chronic depression. In my 30s, I was diagnosed with ADHD. And for a number of years, I took high doses of prescription amphetamines just to get motivated. By the time I was 40, I was in sorry shape. I was 40 pounds overweight, my knees and back hurt all the time, and I was so depressed that I ended each day with a wish that I wouldn't wake up. It took seven more years of searching before I finally found the drug that gets me through the day. I need my depression fighting chemicals balanced where I find myself grinding to a halt and life getting less and less bearable. Now I'm depression free and my weight is under control. I found a way to lower my cortisol, which is the hormone linked with stress, raise my oxytocin, which is the chemical associated with trust and kindness, and get my daily dose of endorphins, which brightens my mood and keeps my arthritis pain manageable. For the past three years, I've traveled almost daily to the same place to get this heady combination of killer drugs. My habit can be expensive, but it's worth it. The main cost, however, isn't money. No, the real price of my medication is that I have to let a bunch of savages try to kill me. I've always been a kinetic person. I love to bike, skate, hike, lift weights and swim. I'm drawn to activities that keep me moving and are inherently fun. Ironically, I spent much of my adult life rarely doing these things that I love. It took hitting my personal rock bottom before I began looking for something that was athletic, fun, and interesting, and involved learning and developing skills. Oddly enough, in my search, what I found was this strange martial art called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Now as a 51 year old practitioner with nearly four years of training, I can't imagine my life without it. Fake as much as you want to. If you can steering wheel him or her a little bit open, it creates a better path, right? Some other names we have for Jiu Jitsu include folding laundry with the person inside, involuntary yoga and pajama wrestling. But no matter what you call it, Jiu Jitsu emphasizes using torque and leverage to control an opponent and cause them to submit to your authority through the use of pins, non-lethal chokes, and joint locks. You've heard of the phrase tap out? That's the ultimate aim of Jiu Jitsu, to force an opponent to tap out, to voluntarily give up the fight without having to beat them into submission as in other striking martial arts. Everyone in here treats you like family. No one wants to see you hurt. No one has a big ego. It's a great environment. I'm really glad I chose this school. It's a reality check that you are human, you will get bumps and bruises, but it's nothing to worry about. Don't panic, just keep moving forward, keep your chin up, and just keep going, keep being you. That's one of my goals, is to be a black belt. How old are you? I'm 21. Because of the nature of jiu-jitsu as a grappling rather than striking martial art, the players can utilize their skills against each other to their fullest. Unlike sparring in boxing, Muay Thai, or karate, you don't need to wear padding or gloves to spar because no one's attempting to punch you in the head or the kidneys. Also, unlike many martial arts that involve endless katas or shadow boxing and going through the forms, solo drilling in Jiu Jitsu is the less optimal scenario. You simply need a partner who knows the basic moves and a padded floor and you can spar and train with full contact and maximum effort. And of course, you need a teacher. And guys, always make sure that when we bring um, part of, uh, team members out that you're paying attention to the details. Everything is details. You might think you know something, but you don't know it unless you have a very good understanding of the details, okay? So it's very important. Okay? When I was uh, 13, my daddy wanted me to get some kind of you know, obligations and learn how to run classes. So I become of a instructor, like a side instructor, you know, people show up and show them how back fall, front row, back row, hipscape, bridges and stuff like that. Then I start become a basic instructor for kids. And then after when I was 15, 16, then I start become a instructor for little kids. And then 
I got bigger kids, and then when I was 17, I got adults. It was a process. There, there's a lot of people that, that are instructors but have never taken any formal classes on instructing. I think there's a time and a, a time and a period where an instructor or a professor should start molding students to instruct, not the student make a black belt one day and all of a sudden, okay, you're a teacher and they've never taught in their lives. Uh, I've been fortunate, you know, I've been in the military as well. The military sent me to in instructor uh, schools and so did my law enforcement career. And so I, there's many ways to teach different people. You know, not everybody learns the same. We're not all uh, cut from the same mold. You know, you have audio visual learners and hands-on type learners and, you know, people learn differently and people are all different shapes, sizes and ages and sexes and, you know, you got to figure out what works best for that individual. You know, they're motivated and they want to learn. Yeah, they're going to learn and they, they're, they're going to, you know, and, I, and I'll make sure of that. The day I started training jujitsu, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I couldn't have lucked into a better place to do it. The academy where I train is run by professors Alex and Alicia Sandoval. Professor Alicia is one of a growing number of women to achieve a black belt. As a blue and purple belt, she won multiple IBJJF state, regional, and world titles. Professor Alex is an Army veteran that worked on the Secret Service White House detail for Bill Clinton. In law enforcement, that's the best of the best. After leaving the Secret Service, he worked as a special investigations detective, which put him in contact with some of the most dangerous and corrupt individuals in our society. My academy is truly family run. Both of Alex and Alicia's children are talented grapplers, and Alex Jr. is also one of my coaches. My kids have been involved in some in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu forever, and you know they've done other grappling sports and events as well. So uh, they they've come on their own. They, everything they've done and worked for, they did on their own. Uh, I've always supported them. I've never pressured them. And, I always believed in them, and um, you know, I, I, I think they've uh, taken the torch and have done some amazing things on their own. It is a family operation because I grew up helping my parents operate the gym. I started helping teach kids class, like with my father, and like around probably 14, 15 years old. So like, I kind of always been pretty involved with it, with my like as far as like me and my dad and like my mom. So it's been. In that aspect, yeah, it's very family operated, but like, it honestly is not just about that. Like, it takes the people here that make it that family setting. And like, the people kind of like, when they walk through that door, like, I think everybody kind of puts everything aside and just like wants to help one another. And I think we established like a great, um, like a great setting to do that. I do this because when you hold like this, it's gonna tell the guy you're up to something. This way, like here, I'm loose. They don't know what's really going on. They kind of relax and let their guard <laughs> down a little bit more. So this is, I use this like a lot to like set up my push-pull triangle. It's kind of a funny story about how I started. Um, I had trained for a year and I hated it. And then my dad was like, okay, but you're finishing the year because you made a commitment. We signed a contract, you're finishing this year. So I finished the year and then I took like a year off and then like I'd be on the side of the mat kind of watching my brother and I'd be like really bored. And then I'd be like, Pop, can I just hop in? Can I just, can I just do something? Like I'm, I'm so bored. And he'd be like, no, you didn't want to do it. And so that happened for like about a year and a half. And then finally he let me start doing jujitsu again because I was like, okay, you know, I'm older, like I, I want to do it. And um, I think like one of my first tournaments was Pan Ams, right? And um, they weren't allowing white belts to compete, but I didn't know that. And I, so we signed me up for the gray belt division and I showed up in a white belt. And uh, that was like my first tournament. And I took that. And then ever since I had competed for that first time, that was what made me kind of fall in love with jujitsu and competitive sports and wrestling and stuff. So. If he's not falling and you go to the mouth, it's because you're doing wrong. The only reason he put the hand on the floor is because you're gonna crash his face on the floor. And that only happen if you raise and look to the side. If I try to go from here, it's not enough power. So I go up first, and when I get the maximum of the momentum, I look to the side and I start going. 
And now I stretch the left leg and I bring it in to the triangle. This Ready? Side. One, two, three. Let's do it. I think a lot of people believe uh, on the, you know, the path we take to like uh, build up strong as a family. You know, of course it's business, but you know, we, we try to keep as a family. No, no, pull him. Pull him. Pull him. Yes, get the hooks, this side. One, two, perfect. Uh, some days you do very well, some days you do bad. You know, like uh, me, I want to start to become a teacher. It was very, uh, many days it was like, I couldn't control the, the kids and, you know, you don't feel confident, but you build. It's something you build, you know. Uh, but build under consistency. If you're not consistent here, so you're not gonna get good. I think it's everything in life, right? Ever since we opened, I've always like wanted like to be involved in it. Like I didn't want to just leave it up to my parents to like run the show while I'm like at home sitting on the couch being a potato. Nice. Run to the head. No, no, run to the head first. Like, uh, this academy is amazing. I know Alex uh, since 1999, and uh, I used to come down here for many reasons because I have a different friends and students living here. So uh, we we usually see each other very often. They do a very good job and they work hard for the community and they try to keep the stands of Castle Gracie high. Ask about jujitsu here. Yeah. Maybe that's a good girl topic for you to cover. I don't need to ask about it. I just got it. You just you just covered it. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been doing this? Um, it'll be 14 years in June. Right? No, 15 since 2008. And you um, have been an instructor officially for how long? I actually started helping with kids as a blue belt. Okay. So it's been a, a long time that I've been on the mat. How old were your kids when you started teaching? 2010 is probably when I started t teaching. So she was already six and he was about nine. So he started pretty, I mean, she started pretty soon after that. Yeah, and then he, my son started a year before me. Posted on the wall at the back of the academy, there's a poster with the rules and etiquette. I found this particularly helpful. I took a picture of it with my phone and I studied it at home. Though I was uncoordinated, unathletic, in poor condition, and overweight, I wanted to be a good student. At first I couldn't do much but flail about and unsuccessfully attempt to muscle my way out of chokes and arm locks. Though I can't remember a single technique from the first few months after I started, I well remember some of the more important lessons I learned in the first few days and weeks I trained. For example, my coach Jeff taught me how to tie my gi pants so they don't fall down. I learned how to tie my jiu-jitsu belt properly on YouTube from Hinner Gracie. I currently favor the Hollywood Superlock method. Learning how to shake hands the Carlson Gracie way was one of the more difficult skills to master. I also learned how to clean the mats and the most essential lesson, how to tap when being submitted. These were all important lessons in respect and belonging, but they didn't always go well. Take for example the rule about tapping when getting subbed. One time when I was still pretty new, I was sparring with a training partner who happened to be a nurse. We didn't know each other very well at the time. This guy wrapped my gi thoroughly around my neck in a clock choke. My hands were also caught up in my gi. As I started to see stars and lose consciousness, I scrabbled at my partner's legs with twitchy fingers in an attempt to signal my submission. He didn't get the message. When I next woke up, I was lying flat on my back with three guys staring down at me. One a nurse, one a fireman, and the other a paramedic. Were they trying to revive me or asking if I was okay? No. They were my training partners and they were laughing at me. It was pretty funny and I joined in the laughter. Now that nurse that choked me out is my great friend. We have trained together weekly for more than three years, cheered each other on at promotions and competitions, and shared lunch and beers at the local taco shop. When I first came in here, I'd only been here for about four weeks and um, your, your daughter, Nina, came in and Alex said, hey, Nina, roll with Bailey, he's okay. That was like the endorsement, he's okay. Like, he won't be a jerk, whatever. I don't know what that even means. So she, she came over there, she was 14 years old. She 
passed my guard by doing a cartwheel over me, and then did a spinning arm bar and popped my arm four times. <laughs> pop, 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 pop. And um, now, you know, this may probably won't ever make the cut, but the point is that, well, actually, I'm gonna tell that story. The point is, is that when I got my ass kicked by a 14-year-old girl, I mean, I knew this was legit. When I started BJJ, this was many years ago, 93. And at that time, the, the, the Jiu Jitsu was really for the, the people who really wanna, who really were, wanna pay the price to, to be a champion. And you need a lot of commitment, a lot of discipline. And your teachers like Junior and Marcel Alonso, they all charge us to be committed with the training, you know, to sacrifice some parts to be able to achieve our goals. You know, I'm privileged and I'm honored to, to uh, be allowed to be on the team by Carlson Gracie Jr. himself. I had the pleasure of meeting Carlson Gracie Sr. as well before he passed away. And um, very intense individual with a big heart. You know, you could just feel it when you talk to him. Tell me how you found this academy. Uh, my daughter's been coming here for, she was coming here for about six months before I signed up. So we How were, long have you been here? Uh, almost a year, be a year next month. And you are a uh, white belt? White belt, one stripe white belt. One yes. stripe white belt, and yes. you just took some gold medals? I, I took one gold medal, yes, at yeah? AGF. Yeah, two submissions, um, took first place, yes. So how did you like today's lesson? Um, I liked it because it's my second time meeting Carlson Gracie. Oh, that's really cool. What about the, um, the techniques that you learned today? It really, it's probably gonna help me really a, a lot because um, it's probably gonna help me a lot in World League because it's like a lot of submissions you can get on someone. It can take you to really good places. It feels really nice to have someone to support me through this. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Do you guys ever um, like drill at home together? Does he teach you things that he learned? No, no, he's like, no, 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 I don't. no teaching. I don't teach. I don't teach. No, I'm, I'm not there yet. So. That's awesome. Because chances are I'm doing it wrong, so I don't know well, really you go. Your bad habits. But you could probably take him out though, right? She yeah. outranks me. I know. So. Seriously. So what's your best what's your best move? What's your what's your game? Like what's your A game? Probably mount armbar. Mount armbar. What's the key to a good mount armbar? Um like knees in the armpits. Knees in the armpits. Pressure. Right? Control. All right. Well, you're going to be a monster someday, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that answer. I just love the camaraderie. Um, how they kind of just teach everybody to work together and you know help your teammates out. Um, you know, if you're not competing, help somebody out who is. And then I just love their discipline. I've seen what it does for the children, what it does has done for my daughter, and I just I'm just amazed by it every day. So I brought my kids. The gym was real close to my house, and I wanted my young kids to have some sort of experience in martial arts and, and to work out and to be better athletes. And I always knew that jujitsu was a great way to develop mobility, strength, skill, balance. And uh, I came to the gym and tried it out with my boys and they really had a great time. I thought the coaching was excellent. Um, Coach Alex, he was running a great kids program and I put my kids in it and they had a blast and were doing really well. And observing them, I started to understand that maybe as their father, I should learn some of this as well so that I could be a good resource and help support them in their journey in jujitsu. Even though I'm 36 years old, it was, it's been a great um, thing to start and I feel like I'm learning a lot and becoming a better athlete even at the, the age I'm at now, so it's been good. Okay, so you see somebody that walks in that's never done it before and then you watch them give up 10 seconds into their first roll, but then a month in you start seeing them fight a little bit longer, fight a little bit harder, start developing, you know, catching that laser focus and uh, you see them develop as a person and like, what's better than that, you know, seeing the progression of another. Every beginner white belt will get choked. Learning how not to get choked is a fundamental lesson for beginners and advanced students alike. Once you find yourself getting choked and your opponent is in total control, their benevolence is literally the key deciding factor between your living and dying. If your partner ignores your tap out and feels you going limp as you lose consciousness, you are at their mercy. 
and a few more minutes of continued pressure will kill or cause permanent brain damage. This might sound crazy, but the willingness to put yourself in that vulnerable position over and over again is essential for learning jujitsu. The very nature of training jujitsu requires you to spar with partners who are better than you. And for a year or more, almost everyone will be better than you, and you will get choked a lot. Once in the first few months of training, I was rolling with my training partner, Gary, who was a more experienced white belt at the time. In one six minute sparring round, he choked me to submission five times, all while he carried on a conversation about single malt whiskey with Professor Alex, who was sitting nearby watching. If you can muster the physical courage and humility to truly suck for many months and still come back to the mats, you will inevitably get better. And then one day when you're sparring and your opponent is strangling you, you will keep your cool, you will get a finger in between your neck and your opponent's hand and relieve just enough pressure to make your escape. You will have successfully evaded the choke, not by struggling, panicking, or thrashing, but through cool-headedly wedging in a single finger. Nervous is a good thing. Ner a lot of people are like, oh my God, I'm nervous, but it's not a bad thing. Nervous means you care. And I think that that's really, really important. But you also just need to be excited. So I always, whenever I'm describing, like people are always like, how do you feel before your match? Like, you're about to go to this match. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm anxious. I'm nervous and excited, I'm anxious. Okay, that is honestly, in my opinion, the best way to go into a match. You want to be nervous a little bit because you want to care. But you want to be excited too, because it's another opportunity to go out on the mat and show what you're doing. How's it different competing than just sparring with your buddies? Um, really, once the uh, once the ref says fight or kombat or whatever, it's not that much different. It's really the lead up to it is the uh, you know the preparation, getting in here on a regular basis, um, you know making sure that you're putting yourself in bad positions, positionals with higher rank people. Um, that's really the difference. Is for me the value is is really just, I feel like I'm getting better before the fight. The fight itself is just, you know, whatever it is, you try to represent the team, try to represent like my daughter's fighting that day. So, you know, I think it'd be really cool for us both to get a gold medal in the same tournament. Um, so that's kind of one of my goals. Um, so that's, you know, in here, you can, you can go easy some days and just work on certain techniques. Um, you can, you know, train with other people, kind of help advance other people too. It's, that's a lot of fun. Um, but none of that really gets you better as fast as getting ready for a tournament. We're not just soccer parents, you know, that are sitting there screaming at the kids on the field when you've never played before. Like my son and I have gone to tournaments together and competed, you know, side by side together. And there, there's, I mean, think, tell me any other sport that you can do that with. You're a team together, so you're a family and you're a team, and I think there's way more um, respect between, amongst us because we all know what each other's going through when we're on the mat. We all know how hard it is. So we all know how fun it can be. I think that anyone who competes in any type of like grappling or MMA or wrestling or jiu-jitsu, anything where it's a combat sport, you kind of have to have this certain edge to you that other people don't have. Because to other people, you're just like, oh, you're going out there and choking people out and like perking on people's arms and like all this other kind of stuff. And like people are like, oh my God, you're crazy. Like, what's wrong with you? But like to you, it's like, this is my sport. This is my competitive. So I feel like once you have that certain edge, that's where that like talent kind of comes from. It's just that you're okay with doing these movements and competing in such a close environment, if that makes sense, where like you can hurt people. I have learned to respect the itises, arthritis, tendonitis, and bursitis. They're part of aging and doing a sport like jujitsu is bound to inflame joints. I've also had a few injuries, sprained ribs, cauliflower ear, broken toes, and once I was in a cast for six weeks when I fractured my hand while training. Why take the risk, you might ask? 
The answer is that while jujitsu may cause aches and pains in my body, no other practice has had a more profound healing effect on my mind. So as Captain Obvious, I just want to point out, <laughs> you are a woman. Yes. And um, you're in kind of like a sport that's pretty much dominated by men. Mm -hmm. How does it, how is it being a woman in such a sport? I mean, obviously you can hold your own, you're black belt, you're, you're really tough, but um, still it's gotta be kind of a very unique perspective. Um, I think coming from the army helps a lot because it's mostly men in the, in the army too. So I've already had the mind frame of like, just gonna hold my own and try to be the best and um, you know, and not let me being a woman, you know, stand in my way really. Obviously I'm not as strong as these guys, so I have to have like a lot of more sneaky moves. When we're here, this is like a big circle, right? I have to break this, this circle, his, um, his momentum and leverage. So here, step back, break here, swim inside. After many times being choked and submitted by upper belts, and after many lessons, I soon came to realize that the rules printed on the wall in my academy were only a starting point for a much deeper code of conduct. A code that adds up to camaraderie, team spirit, and a sense of unified purpose and belonging. This is because at my academy, there's no incentive to keep someone else from progressing. And this mindset is modeled from the top down by all of the leadership. The professors and coaches that train us create a cooperative environment where we help and support each other. As I get better, so do my training partners. When we spar, it's not a net sum game. For me to win, you don't have to lose. The choker and the chokey both get better and progress. Most of life is, it's hard, but it's pretty easy. So we don't have too many opportunities to actually practice or um, experience that inner warrior spirit. So here's you have an opportunity to do it and you meet a lot of cool people. I was a purple belt when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2016. And um, if I wouldn't have had the people surrounded me in Jiu Jitsu, I, I would have had a really, really rough time mentally and even physically. Um, I, I tried to show up to the mats and train as much as I could after chemo and whenever I got cleared to train after my surgeries I would just come in or either just watch or you know go to competitions and just help support the team. Um, just staying connected and staying in the group and just um, you know not, not isolating myself just really really helped and I, I would not have made it through the way I did um, without all of my friends and family in Jiu Jitsu for sure. Yeah, it was. It was a hard time, but they definitely made it easier. The question I have for you is, why are you doing jujitsu at, at your age, especially? I mean, not that you're old. <laughs> you're old like me a little bit, kind of. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is brutal, and it's brutal on our bodies, takes a toll, but it's also great exercise. I get it, but like, what, you? Yeah, I don't feel like it's that tough on my body, um, probably because I wrestled for so long, so I'm kind of used to this type of grind, so it feels real natural for me. Um, I do it just because, one, for um, I, fitness has been kind of this, a major part of my life since I was um, five years old, so I'm a fireman as well as owning a construction company, so I need to stay physically fit for both jobs, um, so this kind of plays into it, and then it's just kind of a natural sport for me. Like I said, I wrestled in college. I wrestled for a long time. Uh, it's a great workout. I like the camaraderie. Um, you don't find a group of people that really wants to come in here and suffer like that. You know, we're a little bit weird and uh, not normal, so uh, really good community, kind of self-regulating community, very nice people, um, so that's kind of why I do it. Tony, what's up, bud? Tell me about tell me about what it's like coming here in the morning. Oh man, it's like washing up on a shipwreck on the shore <laughs> with bodies and debris all around. That's what I feel like. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> So you like starting your day every day with a good shipwreck? Yep. Surviving the shipwreck, surviving the, the tsunami, man. So I don't care if it's the state finals, if it's nationals, or even if it's just a small local tournament, I'm gonna wrestle every single match the same. 
It doesn't matter what kind of match it is. There's no such thing as a special match. And I think that as soon as like people start thinking like, oh my god, this is the state finals. Oh my god, this is finals at Worlds. Like, um, what, what's gonna happen? It's just another match. And that's kind of like a big thing of how I look at all my matches. It's just another match. I come in, beginning of the day, laser focused. And that focus just like translates through the rest of the day. Um, they're good training partners because you can kind of take or use um, something different with everybody. Uh, one guy might go with and practice a certain guard or a certain pass or let them pass me or practice my defense, something like that. So it really takes a community to get you ready for these big tournaments. So um, whether it's a new white belt or a new blue belt or a purple belt or a brown belt or a black belt, you kind of get something from everybody. So that's kind of the nice thing about jiu-jitsu too. What are you doing? <laughs> so let's say you got anything, right? De La Hiva, you're going deep De La Hiva. This is the most important thing. When we go to a competition, we go as a team and we compete as a team. Each individual victory adds to the success of the team. Hence, we are motivated to help and lift each other. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. Because even before coming in, trying to lock. Oh, there you go. Lock this down. Some of the higher belts are a little more apt to uh, give advice or help out during open mats. Just like this kind of little lesson that Obi just did. It, there, there, there's, those, there's those little details, yeah, the, exactly like that. Those little details that you don't get a lot of the times when you're just training and doing drills. So. I have never felt panic like that which I have felt sparring with a relentless training partner. It is swimming to the bottom of the pool and holding your breath as long as you can. And then when you can't any longer, having someone suddenly grab your ankles and hold you down. In sparring, you push the edge between self-regulation and the fight, flight, or freeze state and learn to recognize when you are crossing that line and bringing yourself back through focus, concentration, and breathing. You develop more and more tolerance to stress, gain patience under adversity, emotional flexibility, and resilience. I believe that learning to regulate this feeling of panic has vast application to dealing with the stress and traumas many of us have been through. Jiu-Jitsu is finding the dividing line between the pressure that will crush you and the very moment when you must give in and come up for air. You must submit or lose consciousness. Your very power to think and to reason is at stake. All of jiu-jitsu's defense begins with creating and controlling space. In the case of the most lethal attack, the choke, it can come down to literally making the space to breathe. So tell me, how, how was it rolling with a couple of the greats of jiu-jitsu today? It was amazing. I know they took it easy on me, but they made me work my game. And that was tough enough. And I got rewarded by completing the task, even though I was exhausted. I have what's called cerebral ataxia, which affects the central nervous system and the brainstem, and it affects your walk, walking, your gait, and your speech, as you can probably tell. <laughs> uh, it's a challenge. But I'd rather do this than do anything else. When I have side control, it's not just side control, there's a lot of little details. I want his arm here. I want my gable grip here. Preferably I want my shoulder on a carotid artery, making it a little bit difficult for him to get oxygen to his little brain. So I want to bring my shoulder here and then go under his chin, see? He doesn't like that, right? Yeah. What? Uh -huh. Yeah, see? So we're good here, okay? Good. See again. So my hips come out. If I keep this hand here, look, I don't ever do tricep extensions. I just use my hips if I need to. He's already loose anyway. I drop, right? Come here. Same thing. His leg is on my shoulder, not my bicep. You okay? No. What's wrong? I'll get it. Oh, I like to put my shin <laughs> where there's a lot of little nerve endings too. So I'm here, right? I can clasp my hands if I want to make it very uncomfortable or just grab here. Shoulder pressure on his neck. Scorpion kick. Bring my here, 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 whatever you guys like, okay? Your body is meant Three, to two, have some kind one, of physical struggle. Um, and without it, you 
you start right, to build stop. your own struggles so, in your mind. The primal survival feeling here, when you walk out, it doesn't matter what mental stresses you have, the world could be falling apart, uh, but you feel alive. It's a reset, it's a hard reset, Go. man. I feel like more you know how to fight, better you are equipped to actually handle the rest of the life because you're not walking around with a cup full. You know, you're not walking on eggshells and you're not stressed out. Um, this gives you an ability to one, gives you self-confidence and for me, like this sweat and this physical contact, it's releasing that, it's releasing that negative energy out of me. So when I go rest of the day, I'm cool as a cucumber. Uh, when you're training in, in any combat sport, there's a bit of a camaraderie that comes with just individuals going through this same uh, struggle, if you will, this same uh, environment in which you're, you're working hard and everybody's in on it. And we see the same thing in the field, especially, uh, and I can say specifically from the fire department side, when you're on a call, if you're on a fire, yeah, if you happen to be working on the interior and you're working on a house fire, there's a great deal of physical stress that goes into that. You're just really working your tail off in there. And so at the end of that work cycle, when you're sent out to rehab, an area in which we're able to take a little bit of a break, get replenished through fluids and the such, uh, you're out there saying, wow, look at the work we did. And that's what bonds everybody together uh, at, a, at a fire station is we're working together, we're training together. That's why when people are out at the grocery store, they see a shop together. We do everything together. And because of that, you start to develop that home-like camaraderie. This is my friend Kevin, and uh, he and I have been training just about the same amount of time. We got our blue belts close to the same amount of time. And um, we, uh, we have a nickname in the academy, the Step Brothers. <laughs> Because we probably monkey around a little, little too much. A little too much. A little too much for our own good. Yeah, we don't have bunk beds, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, we, we probably would break those bunk beds in about a day and a half if we did. We say high speed aluminum. Um, I work at the airport. A lot of different things I say I do, but basically I'm an airline pilot. So, which is more exciting coming to a day of jujitsu or flying a jetliner? Depends on the day. <laughs> Normally, I get more uh, excitement out of jujitsu. Well, this is a great environment for the fire service because of just the camaraderie, the group dynamic, uh, working really hard together. It's like the fire service when we get a fire, we work really hard as a team, and that brings us closer together. So in the jujitsu gym, you work really hard, you suffer together, you sweat, you learn something new, you fight. And it's just like the fire service, we fight to protect people and protect property. And at the end of the day, we're using our bodies and training and working hard. So it really familiarizes me with the fire service a lot, being in this gym. Yeah, you see a lot of hard things and uh, you learn to deal with it in your own particular way. And coming to jujitsu and working out and learning things here helps to relieve a lot of that stress and pressure as well. The best way I can put it is, it's kind of like second family. We're all very supportive of each other. We all care about each other. I don't know about the love aspect, because I hate some of these guys, because they're so punishing on us, but you know, in a, in a sense, I really care about them. So that's, that's one other good thing that you learn here, is you learn to uh, control your emotions, deal with adversity, and that's, that's trained in you, not just in jujitsu, but in all things, you can use that. Probably done at least like 60 tournaments. You're a uh, first responder, you're a fireman, you're a paramedic and um, you see a lot of crazy stuff. How does coming in here and doing this help you with that? Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I actually said to somebody the other day, we were, we were just talking about life struggles and things like that, you know, in relation to public safety and fire department and the trouble that the cops are having with staffing and all kinds of craziness out there. And uh, I actually said to him, um, you know what's great about jujitsu is you're not thinking about anything but getting choked or getting your arm broken, preventing that, and, and um, you know having a good time. So it's sort of a meditation in here. Um, it's also stress inoculation. You know you're you're more comfortable being in an uncomfortable position. Um, it's it's learning that you can't control everybody or everything, um, and just kind of accepting you know the things that come your way in life. Um, so I think that's what's so beneficial about um, jujitsu and public safety is 
one of my public sa safety partners right here, <laughs> Brandon. Uh, yeah, I'm at a trauma level one. I came from a trauma level one, so we get stabbing, shootings, MVAs, amputations, everything. We really need to talk to somebody. Like, I feel close enough. Like, everybody in here is uh, family, so I can actually like talk to them about if anything's bothering me or just like, oh man, you should have seen this leg. The guy came in and it was just his boot, and you know, like that was last week, and then I had a shooting, and then. 12 inch blade in this guy's stomach the other day, so it's kind of like, gotta kind of keep the humor or it'll kind of eat you away. So I try to, you know, um, bounce everything off of these guys in here and kind of just really good camaraderie. How's that feel for you right there, Kevin? Huh? How's that feel for you? Fantastic. You like that, huh? It's like rolling an octopus with like 20 <laughs> legs. <laughs> uh, well, I've had a few teeth oh, knocked out, a uh, bunch of oh. chipped teeth, uh, cauliflower oh. ear, oh. deformed oh. toenails now. I just um, <laughs> torn labrum. <laughs> I don't oh, get surgery on the next one. I was at the gym on Tinder, like swiping, and I just hurt my shoulder when I was swiping. <laughs> you don't get, you don't get hurt, uh, but it feels like one minute you might hard, die. one minute hard, go. Right, and that, that struggle, that like heart racing on the edge of death, like I might not make, either I'm gonna make it or they are, and it's just a pretend, but your body's sure going you through the physical hand experience hand of it. Is everybody here's friendly? You hang out. It's like going and hanging out with your friends, but you're also learning how to fight. You choke each other out, and then you go have lunch afterwards. A lot of the individuals that train here uh, have relationships outside the academy, too, where they break bread together with each other's families and do things and even go on vacations together now. So um, I think uh, the people make this place, and, um, you know, and, and I'm very grateful to be around such positive individuals and then she scoops it in grabs a hand and controls the wrist oh. it was like perfect Joel, how many times have you shown that video of your daughter <laughs> i showed it like a hundred times people are coming in here and being vulnerable ultimate level right like i'm getting my ass kicked i got my ass kicked they have to they have to say it they have to accept it and find a way to grow and develop from it there's no like you can hide from all those mental stresses you can point fingers at everyone else and anything else. Pretend it's super simple to do that. But in here you develop the, well if I don't say it's me, then I'm, there, then I'm just gonna just keep, keep on happening, right? So yeah, you get to see people accept their failure, accept that they need to grow, and then they either do it or they disappear, right? I read a really interesting article that there are these things called hugging parties. I swear this is real. Okay, where people just go because we are so desperate for physical contact. And this fills that, you know, when you're doing it with your friends. Jiu-Jitsu has a lot of ups and downs. And you go through spurts of your training where you feel like you don't get anything right, nothing's coming together, you're not learning everything, anything new. And it doesn't just happen when you walk in the door, it, it happens throughout your different belts. And the people that get discouraged are the ones that don't stay that don't stay with it the ones that accept it as part of the journey and just stay patient and ride it out are the ones that usually make it cuz this is this is not easy i mean you and you can have a really horrible day at work and not want to come in here because you got maybe you got hammered by your coworkers or your boss or something just mentally and then you don't want to you're afraid you're going to come in, you're going to have a bad day on the mat, and you're, you know, you're just going to get hammered on the mat by your training partners physically. But sometimes when you come in on those days, those end up being your best training days. As humans, we are social creatures. There have been a number of long-term studies looking into the decline of happiness in America over the last 50 years. There's a strong statistical correlation between that reduction and the loss of community connection we are experiencing as a society. In fact, it turns out that the greatest determiner of general life satisfaction and well-being is neither financial success nor health, 
but the depth and breadth of one's social connections. This means we all need community. As the song says, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. For me, that's my academy. I don't believe jujitsu is for everyone, but by some strange stroke of good fortune, I found in it the community I need to thrive. And it's taught me a few key lessons for happiness. Check your defenses. Are you safe? Can you be vulnerable and trust the ones who have your back? Work through the fear, the feeling of crushing pressure. Make space, breathe, and tell yourself, it will be okay. Do your best to be a good partner. Make a plan and execute it. Sometimes your plan won't work out, sometimes it will. The more you practice, the more you will come out on top. Most of all, breathe, just breathe. It's difficult, but it will be okay. You will be okay. And if you need a hug, just ask.